We're meeting virtually on Zoom and streaming on YouTube. The panelists are the task force members. I will take attendance. Um, Jenny Farber here, Russ Holden. Present. Uh, Jack Katzik. Here. Suzanne Phillips, Phil. Here. And Kayleen Rosetto, uh, Rosetto, sorry. I almost mispronounced <laughs> it the way it was spelled, sorry. Also on the call are John Janelle, our conservation agent who is ex officio non-voting and Christina Smith, the principal clerk for the conservation office. All votes will be by roll call. Um, I see no attendees at the moment, um, so I will deal with their participation later if that's necessary. Okay, so our first order of business today is to discuss chapter eight of the environmental handbook. Um, John, I have read it oh, again, a lot does not apply to us, um, but the, certainly the section on existing buildings and permitted use and management does. Do you want to hit high points that you were concerned about? Sure. I mean, um, you guys have had this for a little bit now, but um, just to recap, um, the source of uh, chapter eight, <laughs> is um, the Massachusetts Environmental Handbook, and that's a guidance document for all local conservation uh, commissions on many, many things um, regarding wetlands protection as, as well as open space uh, holding and management. Specifically, Chapter 8 is our chapter on conservation land policy and management. So I circulated it to you early on as a task force because um, you're an advisory task force to the commission on really drafting some recommendations on how this piece of conservation land is to be, to be managed. So um, chapter eight, if you've had it and had a chance to just uh, flash over it again before today, goes over a number of things, but specifically on 8.7.6, it goes over when a commission acquires land with existing buildings. And uh, there's really only about five paragraphs there, sorry about the phone, that um, give guidance on what to do with existing buildings um, once the properties are acquired for conservation and open space purposes. So I don't wanna read it, but um, uh, it, it basically does, uh, summarize that, you know, when a CONSCOM acquires uh, a property with a building, there's no immediate mandate to take the building down. You can use these buildings, um, but it does guide us that such structures uh, may be used for activities related to the primary conservation purpose of the land. Um, it also gives some latitude for historic structures uh, may be protected, especially um, if and when they're acquired with Community Preservation Act funds, um, maybe specific to that purpose, but that's not the case here. And um, it touches secondly on uh, that these um, buildings uh, sometimes, um, that the CONSCOMs can, can lease the space to tenants in exchange for services that support the conservation use of the parcel. And um, the conservation use of the parcel, and that's use as open space. Um, so uh, the book goes on to direct us that um, there might be a detailed work plan or it might be to oversee the structure and the land in exchange, in exchange for some rent or rental receipts. Um, it also, um, does say that buildings, um, residents of a building can provide an advantage. I actually couldn't agree with that more. If you have a building and no, no one in it, it's, you're, you're incredibly disadvantaged. And, you know, we only, we had two properties with buildings, or sorry, three, we're down to two. This one's one of them. And so it is, if you're gonna make a commitment to keeping the building, um, for example, Seacall Farm, uh, farmhouse, uh, it does make sense to have someone in it to um, not only provide oversight, but also uh, provide caretaker services. And lastly, uh, to provide income 
for building needs. So um, it's just similar to like your household budget. Buildings have needs and those aren't met with any funds from our office without the receipts of any kind of caretaker. Um, so chapter eight kind of reads as such and, and lays out the model. And for those of you familiar with Seacall Farm, it's, it's identical to the model that we run over there. Obviously it's a larger property and we debated that a little bit more. It has different caretaker needs than perhaps 141 Port Nimicket Road may have. So, so that's something to kind of keep in mind. And also on the reuse of the building, um, you know, you got it early on, but there was a memo from town council dated October 23rd, 2018. And um, uh, that was sent to uh, the town administrator. I think, I know Phil's group got it and read it and uh, but it was copied to the board of the CONSCOM, but also I think Shellfish and Waterways got it. And that was a little bit more of an, a legal opinion on um, the source of the funding used to acquire the property and the building. And, and a, limit it's a specific use, question on a specific use. But during the discussion section of that memo, it, it kind of hits some of the background materials that are uh, tied to the funding source that we use to, to acquire. So it's, it's good information. You have it if, if you're, um, I know you've taken a position on the building, but if you're gonna refine that position or make further recommendations in your final report coming up here, that's also good material to consult. Okay. So, I mean, that's a long-winded explanation about this, um, you know, half page section in, in this uh, guidance manual. I don't know if you guys have any questions, but happy to talk more about it. Um, I, have, I have a question or two and the house specifically is not on the agenda today, but it's always on the agenda. And I was gonna talk about the housing trust meeting towards the end, but there were questions that have come up and I just, I would like some clarification if that's appropriate. Um, yes, I can. One, of, one of the things that the housing, um, the affordable housing trust is thinking about putting forward is trying to um, lease the building. My understanding is that leasing the building would require um, uh, setting aside um, a certain amount of property around the building that would be considered, um, uh, it, how do I wanna put this, that it, it would be um, in some way not in the public domain. I mean, it would be in the public domain, but the public would not have access to that. Am I correct that this property is only a third of an acre? Uh, I can consult the survey plan while you give me a minute. Not only is it a small property, it, it doesn't have much upland at all. Right. The, yeah, the upland is 0.35 acres. The upland is 0.35 acres. So, um, so it, it's, I guess what I'm saying is that taking, Thanks, taking the house, um, the house and land surrounding it out of conservation use really impacts the amount of conservation land that's there and available to the public. Yeah, so it certainly would, Ginny. Um, and um, we don't, we don't ever, other than the community gardens, we don't have, I don't have a land lease example for you. The gardens would be an example where we um, sign an, ex an annual agreement for land. The other building uh, that where we have a, a caretaker agreement in place is for the building only. Uh, and, and the that's garage. Like, now, and, and, like two parking spaces. There's no land rights. There's no, there's no land rights with the Seacall Farm no, so no, the, that's land that's open up to the house. Absolutely, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. They could. <laughs> okay. So, um, um, yeah, Russ. So, if you look at this, 
I don't know if you still have a plan that shows the house, the dwelling. Yes. So if we were to lease that, then chances are the two parking spaces that are available now or the, the longer ones down below would go with the lease. So you're going to lose that parking space. Then as Ginny just pointed out, there's probably some area off the sideline of the dwelling that, you know, 10 feet, 15 feet, which is part of their lease aspect. You've got the railroad tie steps going down. So that would be incorporated in it. Uh, you'd lose a big chunk of accessibility for public use. Not only that, you'd be encroaching in on the people leasing it by, I, I just don't think it's feasible. Remember, or the, uh, oh, yeah, so there's space, there's this, I guess there's the physical constraints, constraints of this site, Russ, that, that's a good way of looking at it. But also remember is that the commission is, it, um, they really only can lease space to support the conservation use of the parcel. So you got to have a, you know, you should have a nexus there to any caretaker on what conservation uses uh, they're there to support. And, you know, the concept I think um, that didn't pan out in the ranking exercise we did um, that we listed and scored was a little bit of shellfish propagation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and that, that, that to me has a, has um, a pretty clear connection to um, recreational activities. So open space and recreational purchase, open space and recreation purchase, recreational shellfishing is what we discuss. So propagation to uh further support recreational shell fishing was what we were discussing when we were doing that ranking table remember i said the use has to have an excess with the conservation uh purchase so that's that's how we kind of framed that and you know that didn't score well with everyone it scored differently a little bit um mm -hmm. but overall not well so when you think about using those buildings that's what you have to keep in mind okay. i just wanted to make sure that i was clear on what the constraints were. Um, so the housing, uh, I'll report on this now since I brought it up out of order. The housing um, trust has asked to be participants um, in the um, next conservation commission hearing. And, uh, and so they'll be on the agenda. And so the, the uh, the uh, motion that we made and the recommendation we made will be on the CONSCOM agenda for our next meeting, but the, um, cons uh, the housing trust has asked to speak as well. So at your, to recap, right, put a little bit more context to that at our last meeting, you guys directed me to send two memos out. One to the Conservation Commission on your recommendation. Um, which they're gonna get for their next meeting on 12-1, and then one for the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, and they got your uh, recommendation as well and your vote. And uh, so as Ginny says, they're gonna be an active participant at 12-1, that's fine. That's totally fine. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, and so we will discuss at that meeting. Um, is there anything else that we need to discuss around chapter eight? Uh, John, one one thing is, uh, if we were to lease this building, and I understand that the whoever we lease it to would have to be engaging in activities that were allowable and consistent with our charter, uh, would the organization it was leased to? I, I mean, if it was a, like the housing trust, for instance, um, that's not necessarily a conservation issue. Would they then have to just say, uh, yes, we understand that we're not a conservation agency, but we commit to doing the following things with the property. So you know? the, 
Yeah, the concept, and I, I want to, the concept of lease is a little bit more aggressive than the caretaker model or the annual annual grower agreements or the annual gardener agreements that we do. The concept of lease does get special mention in chapter eight. And um, I guess to, to backtrack a little bit, it does say that you can, to avoid conflicts about privacy, you know, you can um, make it clear which areas are to be closed to the public. Uh, but it goes on to say that any lease must be authorized by town meeting, town council. I've always got the advice from, uh, and we can re we can confirm this in writing, but um, that's, um, I'm not aware of any time where the CONSCOM went to town meeting to authorize a lease. The caretaker agreements, the gardener agreements, the annual growers agreements, all kind of operate under a level than the word lease. And I, I think there's significance to that. We can explore both if, if, if you choose to, or if CONSCOM chooses to based on the request of some other group, but, um, and we'll, we'll probably learn more about those, those levels, but um, these annual agreements um, are, are not multi-year leases with exclusivity rights to real property. I think I understand. Um, uh, Kayleen, you're, you're muted. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I know you knew that. <laughs> when you talk about um, leasing, is this to a family, a single person, something like that? To when, what the housing authority is, uh, the housing trust uh, was talking about, it was in a public meeting, so it's, I think it's fine to discuss it, um, uh, was uh, to see if the housing authority wanted to use the house for um, uh, uh, affordable housing and that therefore the uh, um, housing authority would um, hold a lease would lease it from that that is that is their concept okay i guess i'm just having a hard time with um as has been mentioned so many times before about all the taxpayers paying for this and then well i think i i think that their hearts are in the right place i think they're missing the part where it has to there has to be the nexus um and um so i i just really needed I needed clarification because I have to run the meeting on um, on the first. So, um, anybody else? She's Jill, you okay? She's I just wanted to um, add a comment. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Now I we can't hear you. Uh, now we are. Uh, now we can hear you. I think on, from our discussions, both last meeting and this meeting, um, after we took the vote about the building, there was pretty much a consensus that it would be difficult, maybe problematic to actually have somebody in the house all the time, um, both for the reasons that people said at this meeting about uh, space, but you know how much of the conservation space would be taken up by somebody living there, but also privacy um, of the inhabitants. Um, and I think I said last meeting that uh, I didn't think it was a good idea, although I certainly support affordable housing and all that. One other thing we should think about though, is I think that um, if I'm not mistaken, that the money for possible uh, demolition or moving had to be used when we had the COVID. And so there now is a process to go and get money. So if there would be a way to have some kind of caretaker, not housing where they do a one year lease and all that, but have some kind of caretaker with a written agreement in terms of what maintenance and stuff like that would happen if the process for obtaining money for whatever we decide you know, or the CONSCOM decides to do, if that's gonna be a number of months, that might make some sense. That's just my idea. Okay, thank you. And I, I agree with you that, that I thought um, the conversation at our last meeting 
made it pretty clear that the bar was high for finding an appropriate conservation use for the property given the size of the property. I think we all felt that way, but I think that's worth restating. But also the idea that it's an empty building um, and therefore problematic is also worth considering. Okay, if there isn't anything else, we don't have an action item on that. It's just to keep us on target. Um, the next thing we were going to do is review the task force charge and, and see where we are and what we can get accomplished. So the first um, charge is to review and study all relevant materials related to 141 including but not limited to the deed property history, the town meeting article and funding and all other relevant materials related to the property. We've done that. Number two, review the typically allowed and prohibited uses for the property, discuss both the existing and all possible uses, determine if uses are appropriate or if new actions are needed to allow the uses on the property if new actions are needed, include what they are and how the commission would implement them. We've gone through um, allowed and prohibited uses and we're pretty much on target that everything that we, we talked about was allowed in, in some form, even if it was slightly revised. Jenny? Yes. I'm anticipating a possible request to directly to the Conservation Commission, we, we might be discussing, you know, affordable housing. Is that an allowed use? I mean, I don't know what the proposal will be um, on first. Right. But and we might come back as a group to discuss right and, and some circle, kind of short term lease. Circling back to um, circling back to chapter eight, and I think they were talking about bigger properties than this, they call out the fact that low cost housing um, is, is incorrectly viewed as a con conservation, um, is a, a good use of conservation land. Um, yeah, that, well, they say that buildings can be used to provide subsidized housing in the manner described above. The manner described above is, is a tenant that supports the conservation. Hold on one um, second. One. conservation purposes so i mean we you know that could be discussed further but it's a a tenant that that basically right. i want to make sure i get these words right it's it, a tenant in exchange for services that support the conservation use of the parcel so remember you're coming down on a recommended bunch of uses so I would advise you to consider the uses that you intend to recommend to CONSCOM and does a tenant support and further any one of those? I mean, that's kind of the question. So we definitely can use the building again for subsidized housing. I'm not, I'm not sure affording versus, affordable versus subsidized, but there has to be a nexus to the conservation uh, use of the parcel. So would it be appropriate to wait and see what the Affordable Housing Trust Yeah, has well, we can wait and see, but, but I think it's important, Ginny, for you uh, to communicate some of the things that we've been discussing here. This task force put high value on public access down yeah. here. So, and, and we know that we're gonna ultimately communicate that. You guys also put high value on access for um, kayaking. I can look over the matrix, but. Okay. You put high values on some things that um, providing exclusivity to the dwelling, if it were to remain, might right. be in conflict with. So it was bird watching, kayaking, picnicking, scenic viewing, trail walking. Right. So you wouldn't want to be in so all those conservation uses that I know you intend to recommend with your final report. You wouldn't want to be in conflict with those uh, per se by, by using the house for uh, some type of subsidized housing. Okay. All right. Um, so, what do what what is our next action item on number two? To do we need to? No, I'm just telling you there might be one more possible use that okay. comes back for a discussion. Okay. okay. So, uh, I'm just making a note. Um, but in the I'm main, getting, excuse yeah. me, Jenny. 
I'm getting a little confused here. Okay. Because uh, about the, the structure, the dwelling. So John lists the possible scenarios or definition for the dwelling. You're saying subsidized housing, affordable housing, caretakers dwelling. Um, what else is there to offer? I if mean, there's if there's a way that someone being in the house as a caretaker maintenance person enhances the property, like having Nate Sears on the property at Seacall Farm greatly enhances um, the security. Um, he does a lot of work around the around the farm. Um, no, I, under he, I understand. I understand that, but. We're saying that if it's, I'm getting confused in the sense we're saying the dwelling does, is not something we want for this purpose, but it could be looked at for be using at yeah. this purpose, or it could and, be used at this purpose. Yeah, and, I, and you guys already, you actually voted a position on this. You voted a recommendation that's going up for 12-1, so. Right. And you had chapter eight at the beginning of your deliberations, uh, consistent with task number one. So I think your minds are made up. I mean, this is a new request. It's gonna be made directly to the commission as I understand it. I, um, I've seen a couple of emails, but I, I don't know if we're getting a formal memo, Jenny, but I, I, and so I, uh, task I force members, one, please join us. I got forwarded to you this morning. Okay. Um, but, um, what so what we're doing is just putting it out there to see if there's any feedback for the use of the house in one of three, four different scenarios. Yes, um, but and and I'm I'm um, I'm asking questions because I want to make sure that I have a, a full sense of this task force when I present to the conservation commission. I also want to make sure I understand and that we all understand what the issues are. So. Um, so do you need from us tonight backup for the use of the house so that when you go no, to I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. I don't have an action item on this, but I want to make sure we're, we're on the same page that we understand that the position we took on um, two weeks ago was the committee position um, and also that we made a clear statement that we thought that that um, affordable housing did not have a nexus with conservation interests on this property. Okay. And I think I think Suzanne just repeated that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think you need to go back. We will, no. unless the commission directs something back to you, your advisory to them, so. Right, right. But there, I, there will be, there will be, there will be robust discussion, I believe. Jenny. Uh, uh, yes, Jack. Uh, can you uh, state for everyone what we are bringing to the Conservation Commission next meeting? We brought a motion to the Conservation Commission that said that um, the task force with a vote of 410 um, was recommending removal of the house. And foundation. And foundation. So everybody is clear, I mean, that's the, that's what we're bringing. That's what's going to generate the conversation about. Yes, that we are asking for an interim uh, decision, an, an in, inter, I guess inter, intermediate decision, short yeah. of the um, the final report, um, to help us move forward towards the final report. We're asking the Conservation Commission um, to affirm our recommendation. And we can and we can answer when they say, "Have you looked at affordable housing? Have you addressed that? Have you looked at leasing it for a caretaker?" We can say yes to those. Yes, because we've just now reaffirmed um, what we talked about two two okay. weeks ago, right? Um, that while we didn't reach out to 
the Affordable Housing Trust, we had in fact looked at it through the discussion on chapter eight um, and did not see that as a viable, a viable option. But they want to remove the house. That's great. You know, find a find a place for it. I'm with I'm with Phil on that. Don't knock it down. Um, okay, and um, so that's that was number two on the um, charge. Number three was review public access to the property, including review of any parking, circulation, access improvements, coordination with adjacent municipal landing properties, creation of new public amenities and enhancements to the water, determine if changes are needed, and make recommendations to the Conservation Commission if recommendations for parking or access improvements are made, consider if limitations such as access control or parking restrictions, sticker resident only, are necessary. Um, and we're going to look at Russ's site plans in a minute based on the idea that the house isn't there. And then our next task was going to be to take it to, is it parking and traffic? Yeah, and perhaps. And <clears throat> And I know we talked to the, we had the police chief in, we had the natural resource manager in. I don't know as if you totally dealt with um, resident only sticker issues. I think that at that point, um, when, we, should when probably, they, we should probably talk about that. When they, when they were in, it had not yet gone to town meeting. But now, not, now, but now I think there is a, sticker structure in place there is a sticker structure in place which and means which means kind of there's an enforcement mechanism in place right so if you need to circle back i think that would be um well, the guidance we got from the police chief who's, who who sits on the the traffic advisory or whatever they call you know they were any, any improvements is an improvement that's what i heard anything anything that could be done so you know so whether it's sticker or not um and we we don't do on conservation properties uh we don't do this anymore we had done it at one time at pilgrim lake which is a bathing beach right which has significance um but uh this is not a bathing beach and we we weren't going to recommend it as such it's a most of your uses were just um conservation oriented so yeah, we probably should figure out where you guys come down on this. Well, I think when when we know, um, uh, I think when we know what's going on with the house, if um, CONSCOM affirms our recommendation, then we can um, maybe make a make a visit to traffic and parking and traffic. Yeah, well, and, in traffic, give them our first choice, see what they have to say and talk about enforcement with them. Okay, I, I like that workflow. That's good. So that's examining some more concepts that we're going to do today with Russ's uh, sketching abilities, and then maybe ranking those concepts and then sending them over for their uh, for, for comment group. and then um, discuss discuss parking. Um, uh, parking enforcement if necessary. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Um, anybody else on number three? So we're, we're getting there on that. Um, and number four, prepare a report that will serve as an outline for a management plan, including any and all recommendations made by the task force include as much detail as necessary so that the Conservation Commission can use this as a guiding document, um, new land management plan. Before finalizing the report, the task force shall post a draft report on the town website and make the draft publicly available. At least one follow-up task force meeting shall be held to discuss public comments received and allow the task force to incorporate any public comments into their final report. 
but we've, we've discussed all the pieces. We have an outline sort of in place. We're still waiting on what's happening with the house and now with parking. Yeah, and Ginny, and, and me and you have been kind of tracking this and kind of collecting the pieces. And I think, and, and the office will be uh, put, putting something out for you guys at some point. But the final report, I almost envision like a, a long memo or, or letter to the commission summarizing our, our, our meetings and our, and our process and our guests and our uh, whatever other comments we solicited. And then that outline piece is going to be almost like a, it'll be a draft land management plan. So that's your history files that we've reviewed. That's your um, recommended uses based on your ranking that you've worked through. It might include a detailed list of improvements that's going to involve the building, whether it stays or goes or whether it's to be reused. You've actually already taken a vote on that. And, but, um, the, the site improvements that we're going to look at more concepts today, that might be something that you include too. So, okay. so a final report, really a, a two page letter slash With memo, me. and then this draft land management plan that's going to lean on some of these, um, some of these work items that you did recommended okay. uses. With, with documentation. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, then, that's like a three meeting to wrap that up, to even to get that like two meetings with you guys to get it up to Conscom for a hearing as draft mm -hmm. to accept comments and then back to you guys to finalize and sunset. Yeah, and then number five, upon completion of the charge and submission of the final report, the task force shall terminate. Um, that we can do. Um, I just realized that Ginia Petit is on the call. I don't know how long she's been on. I'm gonna ask her to come in for public comment if there's no objection. And then we can go on to um, uh, the site plans. Ginia, do you, you wish wish to say something? Thank you very much for that opportunity. Um, yes, I do, and I was on all of last week, um, although I was difficult uh, linking in uh, last week. Uh, thank you, Russ, because you brought up at the end of the meeting that I had brought up at the prior meeting with the minutes from the October 22, uh, that I had asked about it being more inclusive, about opening it up to others, about letting the public know, et cetera, et cetera, and having a long-term use view and a big picture, which to me also would include the fact that there are 22 plus adjacent uh, acres for picnicking, fishing, whatever, walking, et cetera. So I think that that should be part of the thinking that it's not just its own little entity down there. It has a very uh, grand neighbor. And so how do they complement one another? The inclusiveness uh, is very, very important to me. Um, I feel that it's important because it's taxpayers' money. You've quoted that we had um, plenty of time but indeed there were actually only, I checked seven agendas and there was six months break. So the public very easily thought that it was just on the back burner and not going further and not therefore appropriate to input. Um, the six months occurred between March 12th and September 24th. There were only four, if a person went on the website, there were only four meeting minutes notes in 2020. Um, so that would lead one to, I don't know, discourage them or something. A lot of people that have come to speak with me about it are very unfamiliar with how to do Zooms and uncomfortable, and therefore they don't want their perspective, they're shy about letting their perspective be known in that way. Um, the other thing I'd have to say about today's meeting, thank you for letting me go on, is I think that the house itself, the apartment or whatever itself, could be treated much like a condo in that you have the right to do what you're doing inside it, but all the rest of it is, is public land. So if it's possible for someone to be there at least for the couple years before further decision can be made, I think that it could be treated like a condo lease and not a whole 
property lease where they're using a lot of area around it. Um, similar to Nate Sears at, at Seacall. Uh, I think those are my thoughts for today. Um, thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. Absolutely. Um, so we're, with that, we're going to go on to the site plan revisions. Um, thank excuse you. Me. Jenny, yes. Excuse me. But Russ brought up at the last meeting that the two requests I'd made hadn't been answered and you dismissed that it wasn't necessary to. What, so, what are your two requests, Janine? Uh, I requested that could there be uh, more, um, did, could the public be informed via a, a newspaper article or something in the newspaper so it really goes out to everyone and they know that the task force continued, that it's going to go to CONSCOM and that there's very little time frame for them to have input so they feel a sense of urgency about it or about stepping up um, to do that. And also the second thing was about a long-term plan that incorporated uh, Ratio's property that's adjacent to it. Um, we are actively discussing it through Conservation Commission with um, OCT and, uh, and Ratio and Open Space Committee, uh, the long-term plan for that. Uh, properties, so I believe we've covered that. As far as um, uh, as far as public participation, uh, we're we're a constituted town committee that's uh, with with everything posted on the town website. Um, it all all our meetings are available through uh, VOD. Um, I I. I don't, I really do not know how to make it any easier. I have also offered through you to meet with anyone on site who wants to um, meet and discuss and provide input. And I further have suggested that anyone who would like to provide input could call the conservation office um, or send an email or a letter. Um, thank, you, thank you, Jenny. There were five people that tried to show up on that Wednesday before they found out it was canceled. So it wasn't a lack of interest. Um, I, again, I offered that to meet anyone who wants to meet on the um, on site. Um, it's easy to get my, my contact information. Christina or John can give it to you. I'm happy to meet anybody who wants to talk about it out there. But um, we are, we are a, a task force constituted by conservation commission and um, charged with our task by the board of selectmen and we are meeting all of our requirements. I recognize and respect that you have, I guess I just hope that it could be broader and more invitational um, for those that are. But, but I, thank I, you. I, 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 Hear, I hear your comments. Um, uh, I will say that the I think these meetings are um, in the in the Chronicle, in the Chronicle, no, in the Cape Codder. I think they're listed in the calendar on the Cape Codder as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to move on to the site plans that Russ so kindly put together for us. Um, so we have. One, two, we have four, is that right? Four new ones. Uh, two new ones. Three new ones and, and, the, and the one that we had um, originally. Yes, thank you. Do you wanna talk about them, Russ? Okay, the one that you're seeing, what I, what I ended up doing was expanding the parking lot that's existing the outline of where the four cars are, the outline of that area is pretty much the existing uh, space. Um, located the existing cedar. You'll notice that there's some lilacs, the uh, lilacs that parallel Port Onimicate now, we're going to dig up and transplant and arrange them spare, uh, around the, the lot. And then there's the existing oaks along the path. And this one shows new parking that's perpendicular to Port Animicate, which was shown on one of the other plans. 
um, the fence would pretty much stay as is. It would have to be rebuilt in kind. But I think that looking at it to the east goes along the edge of the Phragmites. So we want to maintain that, uh, that delineation line. And then the one on the west just goes parallel to the pathway. And I think that it's appropriate for the location that's there. And then the picnic tables are scattered around bike racks uh, up by the parking and a kayak rack. And again, those, those are just my, my ideas, putting them in there. They can, we can definitely, this is a, a work in progress. So then there's the other plan that shows the parking parallel to Porta Nimicus. And you can see right now, you see where it says edge of pavement. That's pretty much where the cars are parking now. So you can see that you've gained, uh, let me just find my scale somewhere among this mess. Oh, here it is. You have gained approximately Well, the, the fence line is about seven feet from the pavement. So you, you've gained at least seven feet off of the road. And then you've got the width, which I, I made the width of that to be around 12 feet wide for, or 10 feet wide for parking. So it would be basically um, 17 feet off the edge of the pavement would be the edge of the parking. And again, the lilacs are spaced around, the bike rack, the kayak rack. I kept the other area as is. Um, you can see that on both of them, I extended it to where the existing pay, uh, gravel is now. I don't know whether we want to allow vehicles to back trailers in there and park, but there's enough room to do that. Yeah, that's what they're doing now, right? Right. Um, Thank you. Questions or comments from the task force members? There would be, let me point out, there would be a small retaining wall around the gravel parking that's to the east uh, and that grading would have to be worked on a little bit. And it would be probably um, the west side of that retaining wall might be as high as three feet. And then it would drift down to where you've only got about a six inch Okay. We wouldn't know that for a while, probably. No, yes. that, would, that would be determined once things are being regraded. Okay, great. Anybody comments besides thank you very much? <laughs> nice job, Rob. <laughs> well, they, yeah, that's a fair amount of parking. Yeah, that's more than I thought might be possible. Phil, do you have comments? Can you hear me? Yep. Um, I want to ask Russ if there, for pros and cons on the um, section of parking where he has three vehicles backed in versus three vehicles parallel to the road. And my reaction was just looking at it, I think option one is is more aesthetic leaving the few lilacs out there, but I am looking to him for comments and more technical reasons to prefer one item, uh, one option or the other. Uh, I would say that's going to be up to the traffic advisory as to what they, I personally think being perpendicular to Porta Nimicut, driving in, it's easier in and out. Um, whereas Parallel, you could get locked in. The middle car could, somebody could squeeze in and then they're locked in until the other two cars leave or the one in front leaves. Um, I don't think there's legally one way or the other, I don't believe is, um, you know, it would be whatever they advise, whatever they think is practical, but. 
Yeah, I would I would think that if there was a big truck parked right to the west of of someone who is trying to back out that sight lines might be difficult, but you're right, the parking, the parking people will know. One thing that you'll obviously you're aware of is that from the beginning of our property where this concrete bound is to the existing gravel parking is packed with cars and trailers. And all of that will be removed. And now they're gonna start parking further up the road. Mm -hmm. Um, I would think that, that, that's that led me to um, a question I was going to ask. And am I correct in understanding that these parking spaces are meant for people that are in there enjoying the um, conservation property? And secondly, just a minute ago, Russ, you said there might be room to back up a boat and trailer in the lower parking area that's the current driveway. And I'm wondering could, because when, my recollection of the meeting with um, Chief McDonald and Natural Resources Manager Sears was they kept talking about the problems with the, um, you know, the fishing boats and trailers and those guys that are coming down with all their equipment and going out to the grants and all that. Could we allow one or two spaces for, for them, or is that something we wouldn't be able to do? Thank you. I, we could. That would be something we'd have to um, discuss. Yeah. Uh, I think it can do, I mean, I have a kayak trailer guy at the Sparrowhawk pretty regularly. So, I mean, you can accommodate for, um, you're not accommodating for any one specific user, but um, to, the, to the question, can you accommodate for truck and trailer? Yeah, yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, the you are correct though, Phil, it really is to foster public access, use and enjoyment, and it really kind of for the conservation piece, that's also chapter eight paragraph, which is 874. But, you know, either, uh, I don't think you wanna displace the on-shoulder use. So there, the, um, Russ, can I ask a question? Like the on-shoulder use, where, you know, if you have a boat trailer or a truck trailer or a truck kayak trailer, did you consider an option that lowered, that located that closer to the landing and like kind of flip flop this option? Or did you just go with this because of, you're trying to minimize grade changes to the lot? Pretty much that. I, I figured I'd keep the existing, it'd be less disturbance. Uh, and then it does have something to do with regrading. And we can't go, I, you wouldn't want to go any further east to the landing from what we've got here because then you're getting into the marsh and- Right down in here. Yeah, right in that area. Yeah. So it, it basically, I just left it as is. Okay. And, and you, uh, John, you, I think you are increasing the availability of trailer parking as long as you make the space where there four, where you're showing four vehicles, you leave that as being roughly 30 feet deep. Yeah, I mean, provided that the kayak storage doesn't block them. And I think, you know, you can, you can, um, and we can ask traffic advisory for their thoughts, but like if you made accommodations for, um, I guess we'll call them passenger cars, you know, versus, uh, like truck trailer spots, um, but we we do. Um, this was purchased for uh, conservation when they first purchased it too. It has a strong recreational need, so you know there, we were okay with kind of landing support to some extent. So I think some combination of both is a kind of a fun concept. So right, but I think Jack. So you don't have to police this. You can do so by um, we're. I mean, this example probably be one you'd be concerned about because a, a truck trailer combo could take all three of those yep. and two or three of these, and then there's no single, uh, what was I calling, passenger vehicle space. Mm -hmm. Whereas this one is clearly passenger vehicle space the way it lays out. Thank so you. Russ, I think that like if we can, uh, if we can do that without with. Um, 
with site planning and not have to you know police it, it would be the ideal situation right. I think the other thing to consider is that if you if you have truck trailer parking um, in those spots, those are likely to be there long term, whereas a car might not be. That you know, if somebody is going to put their boat in for the day, that that parking space is going to be taken up for the day, whereas um, a passenger car might be there for an hour just thinking. I mean, one of the things we want to do is provide access to the spot and access to, to the landing besides. I don't know. I guess, I guess that's, that's traffic again. Yeah, it's, it's, it's again, the, the use of the, it's just somebody coming down who's going to spend two hours out kayaking the kayak rack can be moved down towards the, the water, towards the beaching area, uh, and then keeping that available for it, it. Now, Jack, it measures about 40 feet from the edge of the parking back to the lower side of it. So you can definitely, this, and as I say, this is existing. And as we've observed, trucks and trailers are now backing in and parking in there. I've seen, I don't know if I've seen three, I've seen two in. Seen too as well, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, right. it, it, you can rearrange the, the structures of the kayak rack, the bike racks, anywhere. Right. And, thinking. It, right. It might be good to have the kayak rack closer to the beach. And then, you know, it's a once a season or whatever the term of the, the rental is, um, uh, track down the path with the kayaks, which sometimes get dragged. Um, Anybody else have a thought? The only other thing I wanted to mention um, is that, um, and I don't know if we're gonna hear from anybody about this, but you could restrict the parking to only passenger vehicles. If you move the kayak rack closer to the road and put the fence closer to the road, in other words, line up all of the passenger cars mm -hmm. and eliminate all the opportunity for trailers. I, I kind of agree with that. I, like I that. thought I think, you might. That's yeah. why I mentioned it. Yeah, well, I think I also think that the trucks and trailers have a, an okay time parking on the side, <coughs> parallel off the road. Um, I think they need more space to pull off, but I think that's a whole nother issue. Um, but I think it's easy enough for them to do that probably easier than pulling in and pulling out. And then, yeah, if it's just for compact cars, I think that's, you know, maybe even get more in, I don't know. Okay. Well, well I guess we, we wait and see what Conscom has to say, and then um, we can rank these, or we can rank these um, now um, or for the next meeting and then get it to traffic. Get, um, I wish I knew the name of the. Packet Traffic Advisory Committee. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. And I can, make, I can make any recommended changes if you'd like some before you present it. Well, uh, my recollection at their meeting is they, they need truck and trailer parking. Um, and Phil can correct me if I'm wrong. They don't, they would prefer to put, I can't, uh, passenger vehicle, sorry, single vehicle, but passenger vehicle down at the landing. Uh, it's hard to park truck and trailer down there because of the way it's configured. But if you, you have 146 feet of frontage on these plans. So like right now they are parking in front of this property. So with these scenarios, we're kind of taking all that away. But we're getting it off the road. No, but we're gonna push it up the road because they won't be able to block a curb cut to a parking lot. No, That's what, what I thought. What I, uh, one of the options had some shoulder kind of accommodation. So let's go back to that here, let me see. Yeah. Because uh, one of the issues that Chief McDonald pointed out was that people get, are 
parking yeah. so that they're actually blocking traffic. So you basically have, you know, um, 146 plus another, looks like 25 Russ. Bound to bounds, but you're 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 playing with options through this 146 piece. But if you, I mean, if a truck and trailer, whether it's towing kayaks or towing a boat, pulls in there, that's fine. But here they cannot pull in anymore. I guess they could, there's a curb cut there now. I guess so. That's not too too different, right, Kay? And there's a curb cut to a house there. So right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So maybe that's um, something to work with, where we have this. We don't want to take anything away from the circulation and traffic flow because they wanted better circulation and traffic flow. So what is the curb cut width that exists there today? It's like 30 feet. I don't know. Any any <laughs> chance we could do a site visit and actually, because I'm not sure how many um, trucks with trailers behind them you get in those spots in front of the house. Only two. Yeah. I mean, one. Not, if, so, if, so if that's two, and and like I said, if we can go to the site and see, because right, you can't see where I'm pointing, but <laughs> <laughs> at the bound, at the far end, at the west side. Um, this side. Nope, the other one. Right. The other west side. The other, the other west. <laughs> the west side. <laughs> um, There's the pole and the guy wire where no one parks. Yeah, and then past that, going away from the water, there's ample. Okay. Um, up up. If it's only two two truck and trailer spaces, but I can't really, I mean, we'd have to go and look at it. So this, With, this, this concept then maintains the roughly, let's say roughly the existing curb cut width uh -huh. and doesn't, uh, and allows for either passenger car or truck trailer. This is for um, either passenger car or truck trailer, but this is the scenario that that does scare me a little bit because you could be excluded from accessing the conservation parcel in a, in a single vehicle if you're stacked with truck trailers early in the morning and all day long. That's an interesting idea. So I think like, uh, I don't wanna take away from the curbside parking that takes place any more than we already detract with this 30 foot curb cut that used to serve a home and now is gonna serve the conservation property. So in this scenario, Russ, you would leave this open to be parked with either a trailer or, or, or a single use vehicle, but this, this might wanna be dedicated only to single use vehicles. That's why I was asking a scenario that flip flops these and keeps one use closer to landing might be kind of fun, but. You know, that also, that also allows us to take some of the driveway out if we wanted to, maybe. Yeah. What, what do you think you'd gain by flip-flopping it though, John? Because right now the east side of the, the lower parking, you wouldn't go any further towards the landing from what's already there. Um, so I would, you'd, you'd gain two, two I cars. I think you would, uh, the, the concept would be you would kind of, I guess it's proximity to the ramp. If you're a truck trailer, you just. Right. You just pull, pull right in here, I guess. I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know how it works. So I guess that's why we have a committee for that stuff. I, I can draw one up that way. The other problem is going to the West. You have no more room because of your, you've got the path. You don't want to drive over the path. And, and the then, path be relocated up beyond the pole line. Um, does that buy you any more physical space? Yeah, the probably be west of west of the pole mm -hmm. because of the guy wire. All right. Well, the, these are concept level anyway, so, so I'm just people, I was just having fun. But people it. might um people might park there on the street and then block access to the path. So it might be better to have the park to keep the path where it is, right at the edge of the um, parking. Yeah, I just think, you know, you have these different vehicle types, concepts that don't allow for conflicts are one that I can, those are ones that I would absolutely support. <laughs> so like where design can um, prevent the conflicts um, down at a busy landing during the summer. Right. Let me flip flop it and see. 
I'll see what what we what spaces work out. If you don't mind doing that, and then Ginny, I mean, yeah, let's get these over to them. So, however many more concepts. <laughs> Russ is willing to flesh out and, and uh, whoever has yeah, any let's, and then let's get them ideas over yeah for, for comment and advice yeah I agree um anybody else on this okay um so I I have that the commission will discuss the drafting and outline but I I think that we did that when we did the um when we did the task force charge discussed what we needed to get done. Um, am I correct on that? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. you so guys I don't know think the... we need to discuss that any further. So I'm just, I just noticed that Jenny is back as an attendee. I'd like to bring her in in case she has comment on um, this last item, and then we'll um, ask for other business and review of minutes. Jenny, do you want to? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I have been with you all along as in each meeting. I hope that the parking facilitates uh, the people that work in this town, the shell fishermen. Um, I would think it's advantageous to put the uh, kayak rack down close to the water. It also makes the kayaks less visible to those that might be thinking about confiscating one. So I would put the rack right down uh, near the other a split rail fence that's at the edge of the beach, I think would be more useful to the kayakers as well, because then they can um, carry their kayaks more easily. And I think in any way to facilitate um, three parking spaces with trailers for the shell fishermen is exceedingly important um, that we meet their needs as well as the public needs. And I, I think it's not too likely that they're going to be uh, more than a couple of cars that choose to picnic, considering that the beach at mid or high tide is nine feet by 19. So even if you wanted to go be there, you're not really gonna hang out for the day uh, down there. So I think having just three or four spaces is more than adequate for public passenger cars. Thank you for the opportunity to. Thank you, thank you. Um, so is there any other business? I have none. I don't see any. Um, so the last piece is review the meeting minutes of 11-5-2020. Um, I reviewed them, had no edits. Does anyone else have any edits? Okay, could I have a motion on the minutes? Uh, I move that we approve. Okay. Minutes. Rest second by Jack, I think is moving his lips. So I'm gonna take a second from Jack. Um, so motion by Russ and second from Jack, all those in favor. And I have to do this by roll call, I'm sorry. Ginny Farber, aye. Russ. Aye. Jack. Jack, aye. Oh, there you go. Uh, Phil. Phil, aye. Okay, thank you. And Kayleen. Aye. So that's five, zero, zero. And um, could I have a motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Kayleen. Second? I'll second it. Okay, Phil, thank you. Motion by Kayleen, second by Phil. All those in favor, Ginny, aye. Russ? Aye. Jack? Jack, aye. Okay, Phil? Aye. Thank you, and Kayleen? Aye. Five zero zero. 